I would like to introduce Jeremy Grimm to all of you. Jeremy is um, that person, whenever we go up to Sandpoint, we always have to meet up with him to hear what's going on. But he is going to talk to us about um, impact fees today. And this is something I don't know a ton about. So I'm really looking forward to this. When I first met you, Jeremy, you were the planner, I believe, for the city of Sandpoint. And you did that for many years. And you have an in incredible background. So I feel like you're the great, a great um, resource for us in this topic. And I'm just going to turn it over to you, Jeremy, if you want to go ahead and get started. That sounds great, Cynthia. Thanks. Is it okay? It's all set. Excellent. Uh, and everyone's seeing my uh, screen with that first slide. Is that right? Okay, good. I see a thumbs up. Excellent. Well, yes, thank you. Welcome everyone from Sandpoint. And uh, speaking of remembrance, I just want to thank all the veterans who may be on this call or family of veterans for, um, you know, certainly the remembrance and um, uh, what everyone has done and honor them on this day as well. Uh, I am really excited to tell you all about development impact fees in Idaho. Uh, I've, I've worked as a, a funder in a previous uh, position, and I frequently worked with rural communities in the West, and I heard all the time about the lack of funding and lack of uh, money to uh, build uh, walkable, pro-walkable, bikeable uh, infrastructure and trails. And um, I hope that you take away from this today uh, both a, a great understanding of development impact fees and um, hopefully opening up sort of uh, the door to, to understand how you can leverage them in your community to uh, build pro biking, pro walking, and pro pedestrian safety infrastructure. So um, quickly uh, about myself. Um, my name is Jeremy, as I mentioned, I own Whiskey Rock Planning. I serve municipalities, highway districts, counties, um, private developers uh, doing land use planning, entitlement, economic analysis, infrastructure related services. I was a former planning community development in Sandpoint, uh, director in Sandpoint from 2007 to 2015, and before that in Buffalo, Wyoming, during the coal bed methane um, uh, growth that took place there. I've worked for foundations, and uh, fairly recently I was the um, Principal Fiscal Economic Analyst for Tischler Bice, the nation's leading development impact fee firm. And they are based out of uh, uh, the Washington DC area, but also have a staff member in Boise. So um, today we're just gonna talk about the development impact fee background in Idaho, the legal framework and required findings, some of the general methodology and formulas used, and then how you can leverage um, these tools uh, in your capital improvement plans and elsewhere. And then I'll finally close up with some examples of how this has been done in Idaho. So to start, development impact fees are generally accepted and implemented as a land use tool uh, across the country. Uh, and they really help uh, municipalities and uh, various forms of government, local government to address the cost of growth. Uh, 29 states have adopted impact fees uh, enabling legislation, and they all require something pretty important, which is this establishment of a rational nexus between the fee uh, and the impact that development is having on the delivery of municipal services. When we look at Idaho, Idaho was uh, fairly early on. Um, we adopted impact fees in Idaho in 1992, and um, Although it may seem progressive, uh, many view impact fees as a very fiscally conservative way to approach growth, making growth pay its own way. You know, philosophically, uh, we know that government, uh, when they're running well and government's running well, they, they should have enough tax revenue to maintain services. But we also know that few governments are, you know, building large surpluses or, you know, uh, building up large reserves. So, um, impact fees effectively allow government to have a funding mechanism to expand the services and expand the infrastructure and facilities that are required by go growth. The understanding is that, you know, once, once the facilities and infrastructure are in place, the governments will have enough revenue operating and maintenance revenue from uh, other uh, funding sources to maintain them. Looking at uh, sort of what can impact fees pay for in Idaho and what can't they? Um, 
let's just walk through this list. Um, they can pay for gross proportional share of new infrastructure and equipment. Uh, they cannot pay for a higher level of service. So if you don't have a, a level of service uh, established today, or your level of service is, uh, I'll use the old car analogy, a, you know, I don't think a Yugo is the right one, but it's one we all know. You can't, you can't have a Yugo and want a developer to pay for a Cadillac or a Tesla um, you know, with impact fees. It has to be um, the same level of service you have established. Um, you can't fix existing deficiencies with impact fees. Impact fees, if you have problems with circulation or intersections or other related uh, problems, you, you cannot ask the developer to fix the problems you have today. And finally, libraries, solid waste districts and facilities and schools are not eligible for impact fee funding. Um, that's a whole discussion its own. I, I really think in Idaho, we should expand it to schools, but uh, we'll save that for another day because today's about uh, leveraging impact fees for um, walking and biking and ped facilities. You can spend and uh, establish and implement impact fees for roads, water, sewer, stormwater, parks, fire, police, and of course the cost of the fee study, which is uh, somewhat significant. Um, it does require a, a impact fee ordinance, which has, uh, and a study which has written analysis, establishes a service area where the fees are gonna be collected and spent. It has a list of your projects and it has growth projections based on your land use assumptions. And finally, level of service standards are established. Uh, when you collect impact fees, uh, they are collected typically and uh, almost always actually at the building permit uh, stage, and you must spend them in eight years, within eight years, unless there's an extraordinary event, and they're spent on a first in, first out uh, order. So you can't, um, you know, spend your, your big projects impact fees uh, before you spend your, your little projects impact fees. Um, finally, uh, adoption and modification. Uh, any impact fee plan and ordinance is valid for five years and it requires uh, public hearings, an impact fee advisory committee, and um, significant fiscal and um, growth, demographic and growth related uh, analysis. So just to jump into the legal framework um, for development impact fees in Idaho. First, um, any development impact fee must demonstrate an essential nexus between the exaction, that is the fee, and the interest being protected. There's a couple of case laws that really um, call this out and, and form as the basis for development impact fees. Um, as an example, the fee must show how growth will add new vehicle trips and result in new capacity utilization of a road and how the collection of the fees will result uh, in new capacity being built to meet that new demand. Also, impact fees must be proportional, meaning you can't make a perceived rich developer um, offset um, growth related issues beyond his or her demonstrated share. For example, you can't have a, a new development build an intersection when uh, the trip generation from that development only adds maybe 10% or utilizes 10% of an intersection's capacity. Uh, development impact fees are not allowed for operation and maintenance. Um, typically, those are general fund dollars that should be funding that from new property tax. And the simple takeaway is that development impact fees have to establish a need, a benefit, and proportionality. And what we mean by that is that the new development, you have to prove that the new development will create a need for capital improvements, that the new development must get a benefit from paying these impact fees. And finally, that it's proportional and what they're paying, it does not exceed their fair share of, of the growth related impacts. Uh, as with most laws um, and any interaction involving money, uh, they can sometimes be subjective and they require further refinement. Uh, Idaho has refined their initial and original enabling legislation most recently in 2008. Um, the de uh, development impact fee legislation was amended to exempt taxing districts from the payment of fees unless it's expressly required in the ordinance. In 2007, uh, the legislation was amended to allow intergovernmental agreements 
This was really important because it um, allows um, maybe counties uh, to collect impact fees on the behalf of fire districts um, and, and any kind of intergovernmental agreement to allow or highway districts to allow the county or the point where the building permit is being issued for that entity to collect and distribute and enjoying um, a development impact free capital improvement plan. In 2006, uh, there were some amendments that extended the time for expenditure fees from five to eight years and up to 11 years if there is a qualifying and uh, strong basis from the, the government entity as to why they can't expend those fees. And sometimes that's because the engineering isn't ready or they haven't collected enough to, to match their share of the impact fees or the project uh, funding. So uh, there was some flexibility provided. Finally, in uh, 2002, uh, there was some amendments to the legislation that really made things challenging. Um, it, it really imparted this concept of a credit. Uh, it was actually driven by Micron and a dispute with Ada County Highway District. But that, uh, that credit language did make things more challenging. And what it did was um, it basically establishes that a payer of impact fees is due a credit on sales tax revenue um, and basically any kind of future or past revenue that, that the payer has made towards the entity that will cover the same system improvements that their impact fees are paying for. And this is kind of, uh, it hasn't really been tested in Idaho, but without going into the weeds of the various types of credits, think of them this way. You have revenue credits, so property taxes used to fund a new road or park or fire station or communication equipment. If the developer is paying an impact fee for the same cap capacity expansion, then, then it's double dipping. If you're paying it both with your property taxes and your impact fees, you, you really can't do that. So um, this whole issue of credits is, is challenging, but that's the first type is the um, the revenue credits. And then the second type is a site specific credit. So if for instance, a development is paying for frontage improvements or intersection improvements uh, adjacent or within the site, um, and those improvements are listed in the development impact fee capital improvement plan, uh, the developer has to receive a credit from the entity because they're effectively correcting those deficiencies. Uh, next, I want to talk just about the methodology and general formula of impact fees. There's basically three ways to apply impact fees to infrastructure expansion. The first is incremental, and that's where you build as collections come in and expansion is needed. You have to establish a level of service, and then the cost of each household or for each household or per square foot of commercial by type of uh, commercial development pays their share and the entity builds the infrastructure, just like the name suggests, incrementally. The second is a cost recovery uh, approach where a municipality may have overbuilt uh, infrastructure, whether it's a fire station or road capacity or pathways or park capacity. And through the analysis, uh, there's an establishment of a adopted level of service and uh, new growth contributes to that uh, capacity that's already there waiting for them and that has been provided. And then finally, there is the plan-based um, and plan-based can be a little more difficult in the sense that you have to establish a, a, a CIP, uh, a plan that you're going to adhere to and expect to build out. And then you, <laughs> excuse me, obviously I'm at home. Uh, then you um, build, you collect the fees and once you've got enough fees to actually build the project, um, you go and build it. And I say plan-based are a little more difficult because sometimes the city or the county, the entity is awaiting uh, to have a, a, a lump sum to match for these projects. And if those lump sums, whether they're grant funding or other revenues don't come through, uh, you can end up sitting on a bunch of impact fees for a project that you don't have the match for. So in those cases, you have to sometimes come back and uh, modify your plan and adopt a new plan. 
the general generic formula is you take the demand units per development unit, so maybe persons per housing unit, and you multiply that by the infrastructure units per development unit, uh, which is your level of service, maybe miles of pathway per thousand persons, and then uh, the cost per infrastructure unit. So the dollar cost per mile of pathway. A few closing takeaways on this section. Um, first, development impact fees have to be proportional. Um, you cannot uh, develop a higher level of service and you can't make folks pay for gold plated things that you want but don't yet have. And you can't charge twice, that's the big thing. Um, so it's, it's really important that you, you have uh, legal advice and experts working through the application of these impact fees, especially on larger developments. And finally, there's that credit component, which is very complex, and uh, um, that's going to be unique in every single municipality. Quickly, uh, running through Idaho code here, uh, development impact fees are a land use tool, and they can have uh, you can have different fees in different service areas based on transportation demand, based on urban renewal districts and funding of infrastructure, uh, based on the level of service in these areas. And by creating a development impact fee program with multiple service areas, you can start to uh, direct or retard growth in specific areas that you prefer. And they are dynamic. They're not a set and forget system. Development impact fees require a impact fee advisory committee and they have to have annual meetings and involvement with the budget. They have ongoing maintenance and accounting requirements uh, in terms of auditing and um, fiscal responsibility of handling this money. Um, but from the high level, you have to have an advisory committee and that advisory committee can be your planning commission, but it also has to have two or more members from the development community. Uh, again, every year, the Impact Fee Advisory Committee has to file written comments, monitor and evaluate implementation, and file periodic reports to the, um, the, the entity that has created them. Uh, they're complex. Uh, there's there's a, uh, a lot of work that goes into developing the level of service. A good plan may cost north of $80,000 for a mid-sized community and take nine months to actually develop and bring forward. Um, it's not recommended that you would develop these in-house and you really have to have a robust study that uh, establishes and confirms uh, the level of service and the proportionality and the benefit that is going to be uh, put into these. And they are very transparent throughout Idaho code um, 678206 and subchapters, uh, there's a lot of robust public transparency built into this. The Impact Fee Advisory Committee draws on the comprehensive plan, on zoning, on your capital improvement plans, and all of these can be changed if they need to be, but if you do change any of your uh, set and established fees and plans, um, you, you do have to go back through the hearing uh, process. And uh, again, all of those are quite transparent. Again, the, the plans uh, have to be updated every five years in Idaho. Finally, uh, in this section, um, development impact fees are fair. Developers generally prefer not negotiating on individual elements of a development. For example, you know, dedicate a park or you know, we really need a fire truck. Uh, we're gonna have to um, have some new police cars for your development. Um, you know, we want a new walking path, whatever it may be, some of those negotiations can be long and drawn out. And uh, to some degree, developers really prefer the fact that they can just walk up and say, how much is it going to cost me per unit or per square foot uh, to, to deal with all these uh, exactions that are related to my development. Um, again, they just have to be proportional. Um, and you have to give consideration to offsetting um, improvements that the developer is making and to offsetting revenue. And that, that revenue one is 
uh, really difficult. Imagine, for example, a developer's building all of their um, development with uh, housing products that are built on or purchased in the community. Uh, if you take the code literally, um, they should be receiving a revenue credit for all the sales tax that are related to that project. If those sales tax flow on to the general fund and those sales tax end up supporting any of the components that are listed in the um, development impact fee program. There are some safety checks. Um, you know, Idaho code doesn't set the maximum fees that can be charged. Um, it's a political decision to adopt the fees at 100% of the true cost. And sometimes this is seen um, as something that might retard growth or slow growth. Um, I would argue 100% of the development impact fees are always uh, necessary for a government entity because it's really a bait and switch. If you think about it, if you're not collecting 100% of the cost to expand your services and facilities, you're really attracting people saying, you know, come enjoy our quality of life we have today, be it the fire truck response or the EMS response or police or the, the road capacity or the parks. And if, if, if it, we know it costs to expand all of those, and if the government doesn't have impact fees to expand those services, they're effectively hoping they're gonna win Powerball or something, um, and they're not gonna be able to provide or maintain that level of service in the future. Um, again, it's, um, it's, it's always a political decision of what level to adopt, but um, it is certainly encouraged to consider adopting them at their full rates. So how is it done? Well, in your parks, trails, and walking paths, uh, you can address development impact fees a number of ways. First of all, if you, and I'm assuming that everyone has development impact fees in the audience, but if not, this is how you do it. You would have um, a park component of your development impact fees, and in there, you can include amenities or features um, such as trails and pathways. Um, you can do this a number of ways, depending on what works for your community. You can do it incrementally, where you maintain your level, level of service. You can do it as a cost recovery if you've overbuilt your infrastructure, and you can do it as a plan based as you collect those fees and hope to um, acquire the next park or develop the next park with amenities. You can also uh, develop pathways and trails and sidewalks through your transportation or streets component of a development impact fee uh, program. It can be a separate standalone category as pathways. Um, and again, you can do this through both the incremental approach, the cost recovery approach, or the plan-based approach. All three work, but you do have to make sure that you've established this level of service, um, that you've adopted a level of service and that you have a CIP that uh, calls out and has cost and details related to the multimodal uh, components. Uh, additionally, you can include uh, sidewalks. If you have complete streets, a com complete street um, uh, standard that you've adopted in your community, uh, that should show up in your CIP. So your arterials, your collectors, anything that's going to uh, be developed as part of a system improvement that impact fees would go to um, expand. Uh, you can ensure that all of those um, sidewalks, pathways, bike lanes, whatnot can be included in that CIP. And I'll go through this uh, with you in a, a few minutes here as an example from a community in Idaho. Uh, the, the big thing here with the transportation though and the complete streets, it's Pretty difficult to do this incrementally. It's possible, but it's it's typically better done through a cost recovery method or a plan-based method, um, so that you can actually build up enough funds uh, to actually complete these projects. And that's primarily because streets are expensive, as we know. Finally, uh, signalized intersections uh, in terms of uh, component of your transportation or street plan. These can be an independent category. Um, and they can work all three ways, both incrementally, cost recovery, or plan-based. And again, I, I'll just emphasize again that you establish, you know, this level of service and a ratio, the number of signalized intersections per VMT or ADT, 
Um, and then you simply uh, work in your growth projections in the community and you know what the costs are to create a new signalized intersection. And you can walk through that uh, and make sure that uh, as growth occurs, you can proportionally charge each new house or commercial uh, square footage their fair share of adding signalized intersections to your community. So I just wanna walk through a couple of examples here to hopefully make it a little more clear how this all works. And then we'll open it up to some questions. The first example, this is, um, this is for a, a community in Idaho that's growing very quickly. You'll probably know what it is, but I won't call it out. Uh, and this is illustrative, just so everyone knows. Um, uh, they may not have adopted or may have modified some of these numbers slightly, but this was uh, pretty set and firm as of uh, last fall. In this example, you can see that each park is broken down. The parks are named on the left and they're broken down by acreage. And then to the right of the acreage, you have all the amenity improvements. And that red box there is showing their trail improvements by park. And what you'll see is at the bottom of that, they have $3.6 million worth of trails and pathways in these parks. And that is divided into or added to the remainder of the park amenities for a total of almost $16 million of park amenities. They then divide that into the total park acreage of 871 acres and uh, further broken that down into different types of parks. Like a level one park is a highly intensive, um, fairly um, amenity rich park versus a level two park would be more of an open space type park. So once we have those costs and the um, components, we take the current population and in this case, uh, the, the park fee is only assessed on residential development, not commercial development. And again, that is a political decision as well. We arrive at a cost per person of about $260 for a level one improvement and uh, about $188, uh, I'm sorry, $100 for a level two improvement. And this is all based on this $44,923 per acre for a level one improvement and $10,088 for a level two improvement. So then we look at the need for new acres, which is based on population growth and adopted level of service ratios for parkland per thousand persons. So as you can see to the right here, as uh, growth occurs, the population goes from 35,000 to 55,000 they're gonna need an additional 121 acres of level one parkland and an additional 209 acres of level two parkland. And further in this, you'll see that that's been broken out to parkland acquisition and parkland improvements. So in the case of um, parkland improvements, you'll see that um, level one parks will uh, acquire or secure 5.4 million dollars of uh, parkland improvements of which uh, the municipality has the flexibility to fund their capital improvement plan um, whether it's trails or other amenities in their parks as they prefer the end result of this is um, sort of a breakout of the fee components and you can see that uh, in this community, the level one improvements end up being about $260 per person, uh, $100 per person for level two improvements. And that plays into the overall park fee of $1,177 per person. And then when you apply that to the type of unit being developed and the persons per housing unit, you end up with a park impact fee of $3,000 per single family and about $2,300 for a multifamily. Again, this is 100% of the fee. This is what uh, would be legally defensible. Um, a lot of communities get a lot of pressure uh, from sometimes builders and developers and planners um, to uh, lower this. So again, that's a political decision. 
I'm going to give you a transportation example next here. And I should call out that these examples come from work I was doing when I was working um, as an analyst with Tischler Bice. And they do have a uh, office in Boise now, I believe. So for our transportation system, um, we're going to look at how they uh, implemented their multimodal projects into their transportation impact fee. So the first thing you'll see here and that we had to do is we had to establish um, ADT for the built environment in this community. And you'll see up there on the left, we've got um, a total of 129,908 adjusted vehicle trips per day. We then apply a localized average trip length to derive vehicle miles traveled. And you'll see we've broken that down in that lower lead red box there by different types of um, development in the community. And you can see that we total then about a million uh, vehicle miles per day and 129,000 plus trips per day. And that's important to establish that because you want to really look at What's the, what's the growth um, going to be in these categories? And you'll see all the way to the right there, the 20 year increase in vehicle trips is about 154,000 uh, over this 20 years. So that's really gross share of the cost. So then we, when we look at the capital improvement plan for multimodal and pedestrian and bike related improvements, uh, we can see that in this community, they had a total of $13 million worth of short-term capital improvements um, expected to be needed to maintain their level of service in the community. And then we pull in some of those numbers from the previous slide, and you'll see that um, net increase in vehicle miles traveled of 1.3 million, and we can come up with a cost for per vehicle mile travel of $10.05. And then we factor that into the fee component. We'll see here on the top left, we've got this by vehicle miles traveled. We see that uh, for the multimodal improvements, it's $10.05 per vehicle mile travel. We look at the different types of development, both multifamily, single family, and commercial, industrial, et cetera. And we've applied a um, vehicle mile travel, a localized vehicle mile travel per type, either by unit or by square footage or thousand square footage. And this results in your fee per unit. So if we jump to the right of this slide, you'll see that over the course of this plan, there's $13 million worth of multimodal improvements being um, identified in the capital improvement plan. And um, if you come down in that chart, that subsequent chart, you'll see that the street development fee is about $745 per multifamily, $1,300 for single family, and commercial and office and institutional and industrial range. But at the end of the day, this is how a community can implement and build uh, walkable, bikeable facilities throughout their street and transportation system and in their park system. So uh, I just want to close with this before we open it up to questions is, uh, you know, welcome to Idaho. Please pay your proportional share. Um, also, I know this was brief, but, um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, you can find my email at whiskeyrockplanning.com. Uh, I should note that due to a contractual agreement with a former employee employer, uh, I am prohibited from uh, conducting impact fee studies until 2023, but I am available to support any vetting or uh, development of RFPs or anything else related to them if you're interested. Uh, with that, uh, thank you so much. And I would open it up to any questions, Cynthia. Wow, that was really interesting, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, I learned a ton. And at this time, I'd like to open it up for questions. 
you can either type your, type your question into the chat box and Sarah and I can manage that or um, go ahead and just chime in and ask a question. I'm sure there are several. Jim, you're on mute. Are you asking a question? Uh, well, I, I have a million and I could take over the entire hour. So uh, I, I'll wait for somebody else. Hi, I Cynthia. have a question. Hello, I had a question. Go ahead. Um, I just, my thought was, well, this was a wonderful um, presentation. So thank you so much for the time and for putting this resource on. Would you say that there's anything different pertaining to redevelopment versus development? Yes. Um, anytime there's redevelopment occurring, you're going to have a credit. So you would have to go back and look at what the current level of intensity or the most recent maximum intensity of that site was. Um, and what I mean by that is if a site went from say heavy commercial um, and then became office or residential, um, mm -hmm. you know, it would probably see a reduction in um, all the different variables related to the proportionality and the impact fees. So they would get, uh, in most cases, a credit for their original highest intensity or originally developed uh, use, so to speak. So those credits do have to be passed on and worked through uh, in the uh, redevelopment process. Perfect. Thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, my pleasure. Um, was this Hannah who just asked the question, Hannah Ball? Yes, it was. Hannah, where do you live? Garden City and okay. do uh, work primarily in Garden City. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. There was a gentleman who asked a question, I think, at the same time as Hannah, and I don't know who that was, but wanted to give them the opportunity to ask their question. Hey, Cynthia, this is PJ Holm from City of Idaho Falls. Hi, PJ. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for hosting this today. Uh, and Jeremy, thank you very much for the presentation. Bunch of great information. Uh, the city of Idaho Falls is just kind of now starting to look at the possibility of impact fees. Um, and and uh, I appreciate all the information. I was just wondering if there was any way that we could get that presentation, today's presentation to have, so we could review it again and, and maybe uh, share it with our council liaisons and, and fellow directors. We have recorded this. So um, we can put it onto our, YouTube page, and I don't, do you want the um, PowerPoint? Uh, that would be great if, if possible, but otherwise we can just watch it on YouTube and get it that way. Yeah, I can, um, if, you, if you send me your email too, I can send you a PDF version. I'll also send the PowerPoint to Cynthia. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, PJ. So Deanna has written a question into the chat box. Deanna, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. So Jeremy, you talked about a uh, level of service and, and using it as part of the, uh, the termination in the formula. But what, I'm, what I want you to create more clarity around is you, you really look at VMTs or ADTs to get to the number. So where does LOS come in? Is that through plans and what, you know, so you're looking at VMTs and ADTs and in the plans they've identified this corridor should have an LOS X. Is that, is that the interplay between the two? Um, it, you know, it needs to be defensible, Deanna. So um, it's gonna be different for different types of categories of fees. For example, your, you know, your parks, it's gonna be, um, acres per, you know, uh, resident or per thousand residents for, uh, transportation, it can be, it can vary, but, um, yeah, you're going to look at what is the policy of the city, what's your adopted, what's your current, because that's the other thing is you can't, as I mentioned, you can't build a higher level of service than you already have. So if, if your corridor is currently functioning at a level of service, you know, and this is the technical transportation engineer level service, um, D, 
um, you can't require uh, a developer to build to a, a B or an A or an intersection going from a D or uh, to a higher level. So you, you would have to use other funds to do that. But what you can do is make sure that development pays its share, its proportional share of those upgrades to um, the system. So uh, getting back to your question, I guess it's really gonna depend on what uh, your transportation master plan says and what your CIP has um, built out in terms of uh, lane capacity and vehicle capacity. So in terms of LOS in ter the, on the transportation side, um, I should have clarified that, sorry. Um, you're looking at, so today it's currently level service D and your plans want it to stay level of service D, then the formula would be if the um, VMT or ADT is going to push it to an E or, or lower, then that would be the cost differential that you're looking at? Correct. Generally, that's how it works. You would look at, you know, where's the growth going to occur? Uh, what's the expected um, traffic flow to this deficient intersection and this one that will become deficient? And um, these plants will actually put a growth share on those CIPs. So you can really determine what portion of this failure is growth related. And then I'm curious about the LOS for uh, bicycle and pedestrian because in the example that you showed that was included and it was part of the planning and you had numbers and you could get to that, but how, um, what was the measurement device or tool that was used for that example to, in, to think about how to get to that cost, cost differential from an LOS perspective? Sure. Um, exit, well, in the transportation example, it was, um, you know, those actual uh, CIP dollars. And we looked at, um, you know, current bike lanes, existing bike lanes, existing uh, lane miles, um, without getting too far into the weeds. Um, you can look at those ex existing conditions and existing capacity. And that's how you, you show, because it, at the end of the day, you have to show that the CIP isn't going to build some incredible transportation system. Again, going back, growth doesn't have to enhance the level of service. So you have to show that through uh, the implementation of the CIP, you are maintaining, not um, you know, expanding the level of service. So you, uh, you, you couldn't see reductions in, in those things. You could have a challenge. Thanks. Good question, Deanna. Anybody else? I know Jim is itching to ask a question. <laughs> Anyone else? I just have a couple I'll start with. Why don't you go ahead, Jim, and then others can chime in. Well, th thanks, Jeremy. Um, the, you, I don't know how familiar you are with the situation in Ada County where the highway district covers the entire county, um, unlike in you know, Bonneville County or other counties where the cities manage their own transportation infrastructure um, and the highway districts are outside. Um, and in the reading of the statute, you're right, it's, it's basically designed as a tool to manage um, land use. And so that the city, the municipal government can decide, you know, this is an area where we'll get the best bang for our buck if we develop and encourage development in this area and not in this area. Uh, the difficulty in our county is that it's not the city that has the CIP for transportation or for roads. It's a separate entity, which um, makes it crystal clear it is not a land use agency. So as a result, um, they went through this whole process of trying to figure out service areas and ultimately just threw it out and said, the county's the entire service area. Uh, and though now, of course, there's developments like, you know, fairly dense apartment complexes in downtown Boise, Meridian wants to develop some of that kind of housing um, that will be paying impact fees. Um, but you say there has to be sort of a, um, 
a connection, a nexus. Um, and I'm sure, and that's what part of their, their concern is there really isn't a nexus. Uh, they're gonna fill this apartment complex with people who are probably gonna mostly walk and bike, do some driving, but not on the arterials that are slated to be yep. uh, banded I mean, five, 10 miles away under the transportation CIP. So there's a big disconnect. And my question I really is like, can it work if you're a special purpose district? Um, and how does it work? Uh, because the, the, if you look at the CIP in Ada County for transportation, you just have to look at the map where the projects are and they're all on the edge of the cities and going further out. They actually appear to be incentivizing development on the edges, which then of course means the cities have to start providing more services there and not incentivizing um, development um, on the inside. So how do you deal with that? Um, I don't know if that, that's a fair question to ask, but that's, a, that's sort of at the crux of, uh, of the problem. Yeah, it's it's a complex um, situation you have down there, um, and I, I'm aware of most of it. And everything you just said resonates. And there's a parallel as well. You see this sometimes, like even a town as small as Sandpoint. Um, you know, we just had a, a you know 153 lot subdivision that paid park fees, but there's not going to be a park developed anywhere near these people. So. Um, it's a similar kind of challenge. Maybe the park's going to be developed in the wealthy part of town. Um, so um, what I'd say is that um, Idaho's relatively young uh, in, in terms of this kind of scale of development. Um, in other states like Arizona, um, you will see where they there's been a lot more litigation about this. You will see um, in the communities I've worked in quite a few um, sub-districts and I guess I would be an advocate of sub districts. If I were speaking to Ada County's commissioners, I'd say you, you probably want to have sub districts because no one can challenge and say there's no nexus or benefit. Um, I mean, the thread that uh, somebody would have to weave to say there's a direct nexus or benefit um, for this in town dense apartment building to pay for a intersection or a highway miles away that this resident may never use, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a thin thread. Um, I think we'll see um, the courts kind of weigh in and um, probably, um, you know, when someone challenges something like this, we'll see some clarity. My, my next question has to do with level of service um, and in areas that are becoming increasingly urbanized around the country, um, they're realizing level of service uh, is a, a very uh, unsatisfactory planning tool um, that in fact, uh, uh, a tremendous amount of resources can be used identifying the widening of an art of a sort of farm to market road into a five lane arterial out in the desert that's going to serve all these subdivisions. Um, but the way in, in which it's designed and the way in which um, development patterns are going to occur, um, they're projecting out you know, level of service F by the year 2035. But once it's widened to five lanes, it's going to be level of service F by the year 2037, maybe. So level of service for car trips alone is, is very um, unsatisfactory for those urban areas. They're like, let's, let's not put so much weight on that, but we don't have the other tools. ACHD, for example, doesn't have, but hopefully will develop level of service for other modes of transportation. So at least there's some, some balancing between them. The other is you said under, this, under the statute that uh, um, uh, government entities can use um, impact fees for multimodal transportation. Um, we, our ordinance, ACC's ordinance currently only says, well, we'll build them if they're part of an expansion of an existing arterial. So if the arterial is not going to be, if, if it's, you know, the most ideal solution is a bike path uh, that doesn't go along the, uh, an arterial or it's a, a whole pathway network, um, we can't use our fees to pay for that. Uh, it's got to be as part of the right of way for the expansion of the arterial. So um, 
the there's a huge disconnect there. And I think a lot of people in the walking biking community, they're like, well, impact fees, great. Well, people are going to walk on them. But uh, have you seen how that's worked in cities where they've been able to apply? Okay, you could, in fact, put a, you know, a, a bigger sidewalk or a multi-use path along this arterial that's going to be widened. But in fact, these cities have said, and I think Idaho Falls is a great example of that. They're going to want to build those networks in and around neighborhoods um, so that because they'll be used that way, people won't feel safe riding, riding and walking along those arterials um, that you then build this great network that they can then pay for as a city. Yeah, the, the challenge there, Jim, is um, and the Ada County's uh, probably correct if they don't have um, a, a separate fee category for multimodal paths. Um, they, they likely can't just go willy-nilly shift dollars. Uh, you'll recall me saying that you can't build to a higher level of service. So um, if you don't have pathways and um, uh, you know, this sort of multimodal uh, infrastructure today, uh, it's, it's hard to say, I mean, your level of service would be nothing. I mean, if you have a mile in the whole county, you know, you know decimal points of how many feet per Per thousand residents, so you would have to have an established existing set of infrastructure or service that you're providing um, to justify. Okay, here's our level of service for bike, pedestrian, multimodal paths. In Sandpoint, that's what we have. We had several miles of pedestrian paths um, and bike paths, standalone, separated, and uh, we were able to establish a level of service for that service, that facility that we're providing residents and a cost and then we're able to have that as a separate fee category and without that you would have to incorporate into complete streets and into the arterial builds and things like that so my last question has to do with uh, this notion which makes sense okay this is a broad category i've heard this over and over again that's an existing deficiency so First of all, you have to have some sort of metric to say this is a deficiency. Mm -hmm. And you could probably argue the lack of uh, connected sidewalks, connected bikeways, the lack of transit is a deficiency that is existing. And so you can't, you can't help pay for it. The flip side might be um, uh, for a developer, I'd say, you know, you're, you're underutilizing capacity. You have capacity here. You have road capacity. You have maybe a bike and, and walking capacity. Um, and we're going to build a development to take advantage of that existing capacity. Um, why are you charging us fees for something that will actually create uh, greater maintenance obligations when we're in fact um, uh, providing a, a, a stronger tax base in the long run to pay for this existing infrastructure? Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what I mean? So is there, yeah. is there a tool or ought there be a tool in the way we analyze so that we we recognize that while there may be areas because of development patterns that you're going to have these level of service Fs, you're going to have congestion, the development patterns are basically driven that you're, you're at your, you have deficiencies because it's not serving those well, but other areas where actually you have a lot of capacity, uh, excess capacity, um, you could put denser development along them, you could provide, there's all kinds of ways in which um, what the, the people have already paid for. There's already sewer, water, law enforcement. There's all these, this capacity that a developer can say or can analyze and say, basically, this is what I'm going to do. I want to take advantage of this and get, get or return an investment to the community off of this existing capacity rather than let it go continue, continue to go underutilized and, and focus and be incentivized to develop on the edge of town. Yeah, Jim, the, the, the challenge is, um, especially when you only have one service area, it's just too coarse. Um, it's not refined enough. So that capacity that you spoke of, all this road capacity next to this infill development, well, somebody's paid for it. So the taxpayers have a right to be to recover those costs for, for, for planning and building that capacity. However, if that capacity is utilized by a, you know, a subdivision or a, a development two miles away or the one that's right on the corner, I, I think this is where 
uh, that granularity really comes into play and why sub-districts would probably be uh, far more beneficial because then you can actually start to price and implement this pricing component that incentivizes where you want development to occur. Um, if someone's building five miles out, that's a lot of asphalt you got to maintain and build um, to, to service that area. So, uh, you know, clearly uh, having a more granular approach with sub-districts gives you the ability to price more effectively what the fees are and um, hopefully direct and incentivize or disincentivize the, uh, the wrong type of growth. Great questions, especially I'm sure a lot of people can relate as our state is growing so quickly. And so we're dealing with so many of these issues, not just in Ada County, but all over. Mm -hmm. um, so we only have a couple of minutes left. We really like to keep these to one hour to respect people's time. But I wondered if there is one last question, if somebody maybe not in um, Ada County has a question for Jeremy. So he has a lot of good knowledge, so don't be shy. I have a question. This is Kaz. Thanks, Kaz. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks, Jeremy, for your great presentation. I'm on city council in Haley, and um, we implement uh, impact fees, and we've put fees to great uses. Uh, a very recent one is for a sewer line uh, to, in, to put in a larger sewer line, so um, and water line, I think, as well. Anyway, what I was wondering is not, I'm not so involved like staff is in how to calculate these things, um, but like when do you have to negotiate with the, the developer and do you have to tell them you're applying it to this very particular thing if you don't have something on their property? You know, we're a small enough community that I, I get the nexus almost anything can be looked at as, as connected. Um, and I understand also that there has to be a public hearing around it. You said something like that, but are there deadlines? Are there timeframes? Are there, are there times when you have to tell a developer, this is what I'm, we're using it for, or can you just collect a fee and then ask your council how you want it best to be used? Or, I mean, no. is this a crazy question? No, that's a great question. A lot of smaller communities, I think, um, are not familiar. And, and this is really like heady, detailed minutia of the law and how these are, are applied. But in your case, um, you know, when you're adopting impact fees, the ordinance should reference a study or a plan um, that establishes what those proportional um, components are and what the fair and equitable share is to pay per unit, whether it's a house or a square foot of commercial. Right, we uh, have all that, absolutely. Okay, yeah. so you have all that in a plan. And then you should have, um, you know, if it's incrementally approach, if the approach is an incremental approach, you, you do have a lot more discretion on, okay, we wanna, you know, we've got enough money now, we wanna extend our bike path system. Uh, typically it doesn't, you know, specify where you're gonna do that as long as you're adding the lane miles. Um, but for a capital improvement plan um, or a plan-based ap uh, approach, uh, you, you, you certainly have that CIP that's been adopted by the council and yeah. been vetted by the Impact Fee Advisory Committee. Um, so that CIP, it's quite clear in the statute that you have to hold hearings. Um, I don't think you have to notify other than your typical public notice uh, a particular developer but, uh, or landowner, but... Um, yeah, you for, for those plan based projects, you, you, you want to follow your CIP, they you can change the order and the projects, but there's a process. So you don't have to tell the developer who is providing the fees that we're doing this, you're just you're just collecting the fee because of the impact of the development on the city and the lack of, of proper infrastructure. And we're using it a lot for um, bike ped stuff, but I just, like you can just collect without having to tell the developer and then apply that somewhere at a later date. Yes, I mean, years. here would be an example. You should have um, some guidance in your adopting ordinance or the study, but 
if you were collecting, um, let's call it a, a road or a street impact fee, and the number one priority was some failing infrastructure that needed to be upgraded, and you collect all this money, and all of a sudden you say, ah, you know what, we're going to go do something totally different with it. We're going to build um, in a different part of town. Something else is a priority. Oh, and it's a priority because the mayor lives there or <laughs> Kaz lives there. Um, you know, they just want to make sure there's there's transparency and clarity of, wait, sure. why are you collecting this money? Uh, what's the justification? And where are you spending it? Because um, without that due process and public hearing process, uh, you know, a lot of bad things can happen. Sure. Sure, but you can use it for whatever you want, as long as it's got that. In the category and yeah, yeah. qualifiers of the basis and justification, proportionality. And, but generally, there is flexibility, yep. Mm -hmm. And that can come, that choice, that decision can come later. You can amend your capital improvement plan based on where development's occurring. Maybe, you know, your first capital improvement plan thought growth was going to happen on the east. And, you know, all of a sudden growth's happening on the west. And, you know, maybe you, you upgraded some of the infrastructure to help with, you know, uh, vehicular issues and you want to redirect those dollars to where growth is occurring and where the capacity improvements are needed. Yeah, there's flexibility. Thank you. I'm going to just break my own rule for a quick second, Jeremy, because there's a question in the chat box and I have a feeling that this particular person isn't the only one who wants to know the answer to this question. I'm going to read this to you, but James Francis, if you hear me read your question and I do it incorrectly, just jump in. Um, uh, as a city calculates its pathways level of service, um, the baseline would have to be based on dedicated paths in existence, or could it be based on marked bike lanes on roads as well as pathways? Did I get that right? Yes, you got it right. Thanks, Cynthia. You bet. Yeah, um, it, it, it has to be defensible. Let me let me say that, um, James. Uh, um, I, I don't want to cause issues for anyone. I've seen it done both ways. Um, and um, yeah, um, what your inventory of pathways are or your, you know, for your calculation of level of service, I, I would sort of leave that to you and your city attorney or whoever's actually signing that document. Um, uh, but yes, in existence. Okay, so uh, I'm getting the hint that it's better to calculate, you're more defensible if it's calculated on, on the actual dedicated bike path trails that are already there instead of the roadways. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's all I need. Good. Thank you. Great question. 